Hello, my friends, and welcome to Origins. My name is Don Chapman. It's my privilege to be your host. Origins is a forum where we take the evidence of science and we use it to validate the truth of creation. Today we have one of my very favorite guests with us, Dr. David Menton. Dr. Menton was for 34 years a professor at the medical school at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. Now, Dr. Menton, it's a great joy to have you here today. Oh, my pleasure. Today we're going to talk about feathers and scales. Wait till you see, uh, Don. Uh, we put together a whole talk here called Form to Fly. Right. And you know, I got that expression, Form to Fly, from a... Uh, laboratory manual that was written by a great ornithologist some years ago by the name of Olin Sewell Pettengill. And he said in his book, you can always recognize birds because they are formed to fly. Just watch this gull here take off. Uh, he's going to fly through the air and you'll notice how the feathers work. They can open and close like Venetian blinds. The feathers are individually controlled by muscles. They have their own nerve supply. There's a feedback to the brain. and. Uh, so feathers are just one of the important reasons why a bird is able to fly. But I'm sure, as you know, Don, today uh, evolutionists tell us that birds really haven't always been birds that they evolved from reptiles. We, we have an evolutionary uh, transitional form for this? Well, it's sort of uh, what you might say is the evolutionist's favorite transitional form. Yes. Uh, if you challenge, challenge them to come up with one, this is the one you'll see, Archaeopteryx lithographer. There have been seven of these specimens found, all in Bavaria, uh, in a particular quarry there. And the stone in this quarry is a very fine grain, which allows us to see more detail than we normally see. And uh, this uh, particular creature is considered a bird by most ornithologists. Uh, but it's considered to be sort of part dinosaur by, <laughs> I guess, many dinosaur people. In actual fact, it is a bird. Uh, it has a wishbone like a bird does, has perching feet like as a bird would have, uh, has a bird brain, which I guess is not a great compliment for anything, but <laughs> it uh, has uh, most of the features we would associate with a bird. It has some unusual features. It, it had teeth. Today we have no living birds that have true teeth. Uh, and it had a long tail. didn't wag the tail, but it uh, was kind of like a fish pole. Uh, the important thing is this uh, creature had feathers. If we look up here, you'll see little lines like this. These, these are feathers in okay. the wing, and the detail is good enough in this fossil. We can actually see some of the almost microscopic parts of the feather. Turns out these feathers are essentially identical to feathers in modern birds, and yet this is supposed to be one of the very earliest birds in the fossil record. And I would say, although it's an unusual mosaic bird, it's still a 100% bird. But evolutionists being convinced that birds evolved from reptiles have taken the next step and insisted that the feathers of birds evolved from scales. And having made that decision that feathers evolved from scales, it put them in the position to then try and argue that feathers and scales are really very similar. Uh, if you uh, have an encyclopedia available to you, uh, I have the Encarta Encyclopedia, which is available as software, you'll notice that uh, this expression, uh, uh, similarity between feathers and scales comes up. Uh, they say, feather anatomy. Uh, feathers are a horny outgrowth of skin peculiar to the bird but similar in structure and origin to the scales of fish and reptiles. Now, you've done some study. Is that true? I can't think of anything less true. <laughs> <laughs> if I were challenged, I would have difficulty. <laughs> Let's just dig into this. I, I think I have a story here what for you. you got, my friend. There are three types of feathers. I know we have four here, but there are really three types. Uh, this is a feather that I think we're mostly familiar with. Uh, it's called a primary feather, but it's from the wing. It has a shaft, it has a vein on either side. Uh, this would be the next feather I'd call to your attention. Uh, it should really be much smaller. It should be no bigger than maybe that dot here, mm. if it were in scale. That's the down feather. Okay. Uh, it uh, pre produces warmth, insulation. Anyone who has a down jacket knows that. These feathers here you definitely ought not to be able to see. If they were drawn in scale to this feather, to say nothing, they even drawn in scale to that feather, these would be tiny. These are the feathers you see when you pluck a chicken. If you've ever done that, get all the feathers off and there are little hairs left. Okay. And they tend to singe those off over the fire. Right. The little hairs are a special feather called a phyloplume. And we're not sure what they do. 
Uh, that's all the bigger they get. They never grow up to be big feathers. It's believed that perhaps these little phyllo plumes uh, are little mechanical receptors that feel the position of all of the other feathers in the body of the bird, which are all under control of muscles and nerves, to give information back to the bird so as it's flying, it knows where all of its feathers are. Amazing. So uh, three different feathers. We're going to mainly focus on the big feather you see down there. Evolutionists say that uh, they've pretty well figured out how the feather evolved. They say starting with a reptile scale that became sort of elongated down here, that scale then became frayed, presumably by genetic mechanism, not just frayed by wear, because you couldn't pass that on to your or de uh, descendants. And then uh, this was a recently in Nature, a very technical scientific journal. From this, we're supposed to go to this, which is kind of ridiculous because this is simple branching and this is compound branching, and you can't derive this from that, but let's not get too critical here. <laughs> from this, they said that the scale further frayed another level of branching to this, and this is how we came to have a feather. Well, I don't believe any of that, but I just thought I'd fill you in on what the claim is. So we've heard that feathers and scales are really very similar. At least that's what evolutionists say. So what I thought I'd do, Don, is give you a test. All right, I'll try. Okay, I don't know if you've got special reading glasses or anything with you, but I'm first going to show you the uh, reptile scale. This is from a boa constrictor. I had a laboratory technician that had a boa, and when it shed its skin, we looked at it under the scanning electron microscope, and that's what the scale looks like. Now I'm going to bring a feather in, and you may have a little trouble seeing the difference. What do you think? Should I go back and forth? Or? I think I got it. I you, think that one's the it. feather and the first one's the scale. Makes you kind of wonder why they suggest that they are similar when they are just about as dissimilar as you could possibly get. You can only reach that conclusion if that's the conclusion you want to reach. If you already have a prior bias that you you're bias. absolutely confident that the scale evolved into the feather, then you can actually claim that the two are very similar. But there's no evidence involved. No evidence at all. Let's just look at a scale and uh, see how uh, they develop. There are really two layers on a typical reptile, an outer layer that gets shed, and there's always an underlayer ready to go. Scales, you'll notice, are sort of like drapery pleating. Uh, they uh, are one sheet that's just folded, like this. There's no free edge, you just keep going on and on, and uh, thus it's impossible for a, a reptile to shed one scale the whole skin comes off. You've seen the skin of reptiles. That's right. We've all seen Let's the look at that boa yeah. constrictor. And by the way, I want to point out that no snakes were destroyed to do this experiment. We <laughs> waited till this little boa shed his own skin in his own good time. The tail would be in the direction of that arrow. The head would be down there. You can see the scales are arranged in a bias. If we flip this over like the page of a book, this is the view from the underside. Okay. And they're, they're like little pockets, coin purses. Let's magnify one of them there. Uh, if you had a tiny hand, you could tuck it right up into that pocket there, and that's where the previous scale was in there before this was shed. So this is one continuous piece. That's not the way it is in a feather. Feathers are a very different story. Feathers, like hairs, grow out of follicles. Evolutionists say nothing about comparing feathers and hair because they don't believe that mammals and birds have any evolutionary relationship. So they ignore obvious similarities while emphasizing the similarity of totally dissimilar structures. Say that again. I just think that we need to just slow down a minute and just say, if you were looking for a similarity, you could find some if you would take a hair and a feather. Yes, you could make a case maybe there. If you... But when you're talking about scales, really it's just folds in a seamless skin. Biologically completely different. So there's just no similarity. This is the way the feather looks. All of the cell division occurs down here in a growth matrix, just as it does in a hair follicle. The cells suddenly die, and this green structure is the feather all rolled up in a kind of a cylinder. And it emerges at the surface of the skin, enclosed in a little shell, as you see in a pin feather. The shell breaks off, the feather unfolds, and that's basically the mechanism. Let's take a look at uh, what that pin feather might look like. Here we're just pulling the shell off the pin feather, and inside you can see that the shaft of the feather is back here, runs down the backside. The barbs, which make up the vein, grow from the shaft 
and come around in a helical fashion to meet the one from the other side in the front. So they wrap right around like that. Let's look at a, uh, another view of this with the uh, shell off. All of the growth takes place down here in the bottom. Uh -huh. The little barbs start growing and they get longer and longer until they get over here and join the shaft. Uh -huh. And they continue to grow until they come up and meet the one from the other side like this. Amazing. So it's all in a cylinder. The shell breaks off. The cylinder opens up so it's flat. The barbs are all up against the shaft. They swing down. And uh, voila, you have a feather. <laughs> now, this is the simplest case of a feather. Before we go on break here, I'll just point out that in this case, uh, this is called a down feather. It looks a lot like Charlie Brown's Christmas tree, I think. Yes, it does. And all it amounts to, <laughs> at least uh, as we look at it here, is it has a shaft like any feather. And it has barbs, but the barbs are widely separated. Uh, they don't stick together, so it's fuzzy. But we're going to see when we come back that in the kind of feather we're most familiar with, these barbs all hook together with basically Velcro. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. That's fascinating, Dr. Menton. We've got to take a break right now. Uh, if you'll just stay there, we'll be back in a minute. And don't you go anywhere either. Put that clicker down because you need to know the anatomy of a feather because it's going to help clear up your view of how magnificently God made not only us, but all of his creation. We'll be right back. Creation versus evolution, you weigh the evidence. The hummingbird, a marvel of creativity. The ruby-throated hummingbird is one of the most fascinating creatures of all creation. No other bird can fly forward, backward, upside down, and straight up like a helicopter. Gram for gram, the hummingbird has the greatest energy output of any warm-blooded animal. Conserving its energy, it can travel 500 miles non-stop over the Gulf waters to Mexico. Is the hummingbird a product of random chance processes or the creation of a grand designer? Today's guest on Origins, anatomist Dr. David Menton, is a speaker for Answers in Genesis. Audiences enjoy his well-illustrated presentations on a variety of fascinating topics. Many of these lectures are available on DVD. If you are interested in the subject of creation, you'll definitely want these for your own. Orders are being taken at 800-778-3390. You can also write to Answers in Genesis, P.O. Box 510, Hebron, Kentucky. 41048 or visit the website at www.answersingenesis.org We're back with our guest Dr. David Minton and he is describing to us uh, form to fly and talking about uh, birds and feathers and how they have nothing to do with reptiles and scales. And uh, Dr. Menton, a feather looks so simple to me. If I'd have picked one up, I wouldn't have noticed what you did when you took it and put it under your microscope. But uh, there's a whole anatomy to a feather, isn't there? Uh, there are just thousands and thousands and thousands of feathers. And birds, by the way, have a finite number of feathers. You can actually make a map for all of the feathers on a bird. It's a left-right perfect match. Hmm. And they grow in in matched pairs, and they are molted in matched pairs to keep the birds symmetrical at yeah. all times. If one falls out, is it replaced? Yes. If you pull one out, it'll grow just like a hair. Just if you pull a hair out, it'll grow back. It grows, goes into growth phase right away. Pull a feather out, goes into growth phase right away. Okay. <laughs> I hope I don't have to tell you a scale has nothing like that. No, just... I, I got that. Okay. <laughs> one feather. We'll start out with that. Here's one feather. We call this a vein over here. And this is a vein over here. Right. And you can tell whether a bird is able to fly well or not by these veins. If they're asymmetrical, that is, if one vein is much thinner than the other, or not as broad as the other, then that's from a bird that is a good flyer. Archaeopteryx, that bird we looked at, that's supposed to be that first bird, which I don't believe for a moment, but uh, that has a highly symmetrical feather vein. If we cut a little piece out of the vein of the feather, just cut a little piece out, and we magnify that, we would see here, let's say, three 
of the barbs that make up the feather vein. Barb number one, barb number two, barb number three. Notice that each of these barbs have little barbs, almost like a miniature feather in their own right, and we call the little barbs barbels. Not barbells, barbels. <laughs> so let's uh, just see how this works out for a particular feather. Uh, the technical word for the shaft is typically rachis, so we'll use that just to show we're really into science here. One feather has one shaft or one rachis. Each shaft, a rachis, has two veins. You still with me there? We're I'm with you. Two veins on a shaft, okay. And now we're going to start talking about a typical feather. Some feathers would be bigger, some smaller, so uh, we're going to, we will give average figures. Each vein of the two veins, each vein, on average for a feather, would have approximately 400 of these barbs, of which you see three here. Right. Now, each barb, each of those barbs, on average, would have 800 barbules. So 800 of these little things that you see sticking out the side here or going this way. Okay. Now the interesting thing is there's a difference between the barbels that sort of point out towards the tip of the feather and those that point more towards the base here. The ones towards the tip we call anterior barbels. The ones towards the base are called posterior barbels. And the anterior barbels, you can sort of see it here in the drawing, have little hooks. You're going to love this. <laughs> Each of the anterior barbels has approximately 20 hooks. Now these little hooks, or hooklets, are going to be part of the Velcro okay, that sure. holds the bird together. The birds had the Velcro first, not before we did, and it's a much more exquisite form of Velcro than we have. <laughs> uh, we can't make Velcro like this. So let's start out at low power. All right. Uh, this is not magnified very much. You see one feather here. There is a uh, shaft in the middle, or a rachis. Okay. And we can see several barbs, one here, one here, and many more, yeah. growing out the side. When it was in the follicle, these were uptight against the shaft. Right, and they've opened up. Mm -hmm. And in a cylinder. Yeah. Cylinder opens up, barbs swing down. Now, from each of these barbs, on this side of the feather, we can see posterior barbels. Can you see them in here coming back this way? Right. The anterior barbels are underneath oh. because they're overlapping. If you look in this region, you can sort of She's see, the you see way. them underneath yeah. there? Right. You know, just in case you're having a little trouble at this magnification, let's crank up the power a little bit here. Here we have the shaft, now visible. Here are two barbs going up, one going this way. You can right. see the little hinge where it used to be, right. you know, where it's bent out. We may observe posterior barbels here. And I think you can see the anteriors underneath. You can. We could draw those in one color. They're underneath going this way. And the posteriors are on top going this way. And the whole idea is the little hooks on the anterior barbels underneath are going to hook into the posterior barbels that are on top. So let's crank up the power. <laughs> You like that cranking power, oh, don't you? Oh, yeah. yeah. You just sit there and just turn the knobs, <laughs> and it gets higher and higher. That's awesome. And now we're at a level where we're just seeing one barb. The posterior barbels are coming across here. We're starting to get a pretty good view of the anterior barbels underneath. And I don't know if you can see it where you're sitting there, but one of the little hooks is showing up right inside that circle there. I see it. But let's just crank up the power. In fact, let's do this. Instead of cranking up the power that much, let's remove the posterior barbels. Okay. If we were to take those away, we would see the, the anterior, anterior underneath exposed. Let's do that. And there are the hooklets. Oh. Notice that where the barbs do not overlap, there are little flaps that fill in to keep the air from coming through. And these little flaps will have pigment on them that will impart the color to the feather and we'll have in many birds a little thin film like plastic over it that behaves like an interference layer, sort of like an oil slick on water. And this produces the iridescent colors you see in birds, like in grackles and what have you. But these wonderful little hooks are going to grab the posterior barbels. Let's, uh, 
look at this all in place now. We have posterior barbels going this way across the field, and we have anterior barbels underneath going this way, and there's one of the hooks. Right, holds them together. One little problem here. Notice the posteriors have a groove. It looks almost like a celery stick, concave in there. And there's a lip on the edge of this groove right here, and the radius of curvature of the hook must exactly match the lip. You know, on a screen door, the hook has to match the eye. The other problem is the hook is over here, and it needs to be over there if it's going to catch onto that right. lip. So there needs to be a hinge. Every one of the trillions of hooklets on a bird has its own hinge. My goodness. Let's tip the feather over and look at it from the other side. Now the hooks are going to be going down. Here's a fairly low power. We'll just start cranking the power up here. At this power, we can see the hooks. It's just that they're not attached to the posterior barbels yet. Oh, I shouldn't even get into this except on top. There's a wonderful little strut that comes across here and anchors down there, kind of leaves the surface of the barbule there, and that strengthens it so it doesn't bend, but strengthens it in a way that has very low weight, sort of like the spreaders in the mast of a sailboat. Well, finally, let's just crank the power up as high as we're going to go here. And if somebody can look at this and not believe there's a creator, then I would say they're without excuse, wouldn't you, Doug? <laughs> I would, my friend. My goodness. Uh, the intricacy is amazing. Here is one of these little hooklets. This is the hinge. Yeah. The hinge is a strap hinge that makes the hook only go in one dimension. Ah. Here's a little guiding probe that guides the hook in. You can see it's hooked on the groove there. Here's another one that's hooked right. that up under the groove. the groove. As you can see, Don, basically just a reptile scale. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't see that at all. <laughs> I didn't think you were believing anything I was telling I, you here. I, unbelievable. You know, like you said, you pick up a feather and you see in it uh, I just see a feather, but when you took that to the lab and you put it under the microscope and you kept, as we said, cranking up the power, you see the incredible, intricate detail of, of not only is it designed, it's engineered and then manufactured in such a way that every time a bird flies, it's a miracle, isn't it? Thank you, my friend, for my pleasure. sharing this amazing, uh, amazing uh, presentation with us. Friends, I'd love to know what you think about feathers and what they show us about our designer and manufacturing God who has made all of his creation such a marvelous way. So please write to me at Origins Cornerstone Television, Wall, PA, 15148, or you can get a hold of us on the web at OriginsTV.org. You know, it's God's view that he created you. And don't forget, that should be your worldview too. See you next time. God bless you.